Chapter 31 Smoking Ears I left for Trap's house at 10 the next morning. The tournament wasn't until 1.30, but I'd have to pick up Gloria too, and then it would take me an hour after that. I saw no reason to be mad at Cliff. I never told him I liked Tony. Just the opposite. Besides, it wasn't like he was making a move on her. Cliff was just being Cliff. And anyway, he already had a girlfriend, and I had no doubt that Katie would be going to Gilliam's party. Who would have thought that I'd ever take comfort in the fact that Cliff was with Katie? I must have not taken a whole lot of comfort in it, however, because everything I just told you, I told myself over and over again all night long. It played like an endless loop inside my head. As I drove to my uncle's, I thought back to earlier in the week when Cliff first told me about Gilliam's party. At the time, I was glad to have Trapp's bridge tournament as my excuse, since I wasn't exactly thrilled at the prospect of being there with Cliff and Katie. That was before Tony. Strange, I thought, how everything can change in just two days. Thinking about Gilliam's party got me started again on my endless loop about Cliff and Tony. Cliff and Katie. Me and Tony. I was able to plug my iPod into my new car sound system. I turned it up loud so I wouldn't have to listen to my own stupid thoughts. I parked in the driveway, then rapped on the door using the heavy iron goat head knocker. Mrs. Mahoney answered with a finger at her lips. A hush seemed to have settled over the place. Even Captain didn't bark. I smelled cinnamon and cloves. Trap lay on the floor. Teodora knelt beside him, holding some kind of burning cylinder. Black smoke poured out the top. The bottom of the cylinder was sticking into my uncle's ear. It was as if the cylinder were a giant fuse and my uncle's head were the bomb. I watched the small ring of flame move closer and closer to his head. Next to Theodora was a ceramic bowl of water with images of the moon and stars. When the ear candle, as I later learned it was called, burned, burned down to about three inches from his head, she lifted it away and doused it in water. Is that any better? She asked my uncle. Maybe, he said. Alden, is that you? Yes. Say something, he said. Say a card. Um, six of diamonds. Clear as a bell, said my uncle. If diabetes and blindness aren't bad enough, Trap said as we drove to pick up Gloria, now I have too much earwax. Not too much wax, really. Too many little hairs growing inside my ear canal. You need earwax. For most people, it just oozes out, imperceptibly. My ear hairs hold onto it like Velcro, which causes it to build up. Thanks for sharing, I said. Ha! He laughed. He asked me if I've ever done the experiment in school with an egg and a milk bottle. I didn't know what he was talking about. The idea is to somehow get the egg into the milk bottle. The opening in the bottle is too small for the egg to fit, though. You sure you never did that? He seemed surprised. Pretty sure, I said. I guess it's all about computers now, he said. I guess. What you do is, you place a burning piece of paper in the empty bottle. Then, you put the egg, hard-boiled, without the shell, on top of the bottle, plugging up the opening. This flame will use up all the oxygen inside the bottle, and this creates a vacuum so strong it sucks the egg right through the hole. I nodded. You would think I would have learned to stop making useless gestures around my uncle. Teodora's ear candles work on the same principle, he said. The flame creates a vacuum that sucks the wax out my ear. Cool, I said. I never thought I'd use that word in connection with earwax. Do you want some advice? He asked me. Don't get old. Too late, I said. I already am. Ha! A thought struck me. Did you ever work as a milkman? What? He asked, following it with an emphatic no. Of course. Just because he denied it didn't mean he had it. Would you admit to, ha to having been a milkman if you'd sold your uniform for a thousand dollars to a senator's wife? Based on all the jewelry Gloria always wore, you might have thought she was really rich, but she lived in a fairly ordinary condominium complex. Did you ever do that egg and milk bottle experiment when you went to school? Trap asked her when she got in the car. She hadn't heard of it either. He seemed disappointed, almost sad. We'd been driving a while when he suddenly said, Alton, you have a philosophical bent. I have a question for you. I didn't know if I was bent that way or not, but I suppose I was glad he thought I was. Are your fingers alive? I wiggled my fingers on the steering wheel. 
I considered making a joke about them coming alive and attacking me, but that joke would be mostly visual, and not that funny anyway. I decided to take his question seriously. I'm alive, I said, and my fingers are a part of me. But what's the part of you that is actually living, he asked. Your heart? Is your heart alive? I wouldn't say it's alive, I said, but I can't live without it. Not the same thing, is it? How about the brain? Gloria asked from the back seat. That mass of gray matter, said Trap. The brain's just another organ. Like Alton said, you can't live without it, but it doesn't make it a living entity. Then what are you suggesting? asked Gloria. Our bodies are not alive, said Trap. The only living entities are ideas. That's the brain, said Gloria. No. What if, I, what if ideas exist outside the brain? Our brains simply perceive them. There was that word again. Perceive. You smell a flower or hear a violin, but the flower and the violin aren't inside your brain. Your brain simply registers the smell or the sound. The same can be said about ideas. They are alive, living outside our brains. Our brain simply perceives and registers them. After all, a brain surgeon can't tell you where a certain idea exists inside your brain. She can't tell you what cells make up that particular idea. She might look at an electronic image of your brain, and she can tell you what part of the brain is active when you listen to music, or eat, or play bridge, but that's the perception of the idea, not the idea itself. So how does that make him alive? I asked. Think about it, he said. Ideas evolve. They reproduce. That's the very definition of life. They reproduce? asked Gloria. Through communication, said Trapp. Are you aware, Alton, that another word for communication is intercourse? Gloria laughed. I think I might have blushed, but fortunately Trapp couldn't see me. The urge to communicate is even stronger than the sex drive, Trapp said. Why do you think people gossip so much? Why can't we keep secrets? Why haven't we invented the printing press? Or why have we invented the printing press, the telephone, the internet? And so ideas can grow and reproduce. Our bodies, our brains, are just machines that ideas use for a while, then toss aside when they wear out. Okay, I said, but here we are, talking about the idea that ideas are alive, right? So who are we talking about that idea? Don't worry if my question doesn't make sense to you. It doesn't make sense to me now either as I write this, although I think I understood it when I asked it. When you think of yourself, Alton, when you think, me, what comes to mind? Do you think about what you look like? Your arms? Your leg? Your face? Or is the me that's inside you something else? I didn't answer. I have a definite sense of who I am. It has nothing to do with what I look like. But I couldn't put it into words. Your body will wear out someday, he said. It may deteriorate slowly, like mine. Or perhaps one day a piano will fall on top of you. Ha! I laughed. Sounding surprisingly like him. One way or another, the body of Alton Richards will cease to exist, he said, but the idea of Alton Richards will live forever. I suppose that was somewhat comforting. So what happens to ideas that are not communicated? asked Gloria. Do they die? What do you mean? asked Trap. What if Alton thinks of a brand new idea, but before he can tell anyone, a piano falls on top of him? I was beginning to get concerned about falling pianos. Or say a songwriter creates a beautiful melody, continued Gloria and then dies before he can play it for anyone. Does the melody exist? An idea doesn't die, said Trapp. It exists somewhere, in its own dimension, waiting to be perceived. How? Where? Who knows? Maybe those are the voices that Tony hears. Tony? I asked, the mention of her name instantly triggering all my worries about Cliff and Tony, Cliff and Katie, me and Tony. Tony has a psychological abnormality, said Trapp. I don't think you should discuss this, said Gloria. I know she's a psychiatrist, I said, for schizophrenia. Just because someone has a diploma hanging on his wall doesn't mean he's qualified to declare her a schizophrenic, said Trapp. But then, Gloria knows my opinion of the psychiatric profession. That was over 40 years ago, said Gloria. And just because one doctor may have been corrupt, it doesn't mean it was more than just one doctor, said Trapp. I was confused. Were they talking about Tony or about her grandmother? Tony hears voices, said Trapp. But who is this Dr. Ellsworth to tell her she's a schizophrenic? Maybe she just perceives better than the rest of us. Maybe the voices she hears are uncommunicated, as, are uncommunicated ideas, floating free.